I've had the opportunity and the absolute pleasure of speaking with Keith Fitzgerald, principal at the Fitzgerald Group. He is one of the most respected voices in the industry and has more than 3,000 primetime appearances on different networks, including CNBC and Fox Business Network. In this conversation that you're about to watch, we unpick Palantir, Tesla, why these companies are still so misunderstood by the majority of the market. And Keith also gives us so much wisdom that I think is going to be incredibly valuable for so many people. I hope you enjoy. Welcome, Keith. Thank you for joining me. I've been following your commentary on the stock market as we were just discussing for a while now. And honestly, I really do appreciate a name like you, you know, spending your time and chatting with me. So thank you and welcome. You are very kind, but just for the record, I put my shoes on like everybody else does one at a time. That's the beauty of the stock market is we can all come into this and discover something new. So thanks for having me. Of course. So let's start off with Palantir. It's a stock. It's a company that myself and you, we both follow. We both are very bullish on it. And I've heard you say in various of your interviews that you are most bullish on Palantir. I think maybe you even said that you see it as a generational opportunity. I hope I hope I'm right there. Oh, you absolutely are. You know, it's it's interesting, <laughs> Haley. I've, I've been doing this 45 years, right? And one of the things I hear from investors just time and time again is, oh man, if only I'd bought Microsoft. Man, if only mm -hmm. I bought Amazon. Man, if only oh, I bought. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, pick a name, right? Mm -hmm. And so. When you see a stock like Palantir, they come along maybe once or twice in your investing lifetime. Mm -hmm. And so what you want to do is you really want to pay attention to that when it happens. And, you know, if everything lines up, then you hold your nose, you wait in, you forget about all the cross currents, the headlines the nonsense, and you just stay focused. And Palantir is one of those stocks. It's truly mm -hmm. going to be a generational opportunity. Mm -hmm. And what makes you say that? Because like you said, you've, you've been in this game for 45 years. What, what are you seeing? about Palantir, even though, you know, they've not been public all that long, that makes you truly believe that it could be a generational opportunity for, for many, many investors that get in, you know, now and in the next few years. Sure. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of keeping it stupid, simple. Everybody always talks about keep it simple, stupid, but no, no, no. I think that's not quite right. I think you've got to mm -hmm. keep it stupid, simple, right? So what you've got is you've got a visionary CEO who is yep. absolutely committed to his products, to his customers, and to his shareholders. Never mind mm -hmm. Wall Street, but in that order, that's significant. You've got a company that is producing significant, must-have, game-changing products for its customers, many of whom, and I mean, think about this, many of whom cannot wait to go to the Palantir events and show off what I they've know. been doing with their products. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, normally, this stuff is like hush-hush, confidential, like, oh, we can't possibly share what we're doing. These guys can't, they're beating down the door to get into Palantir's events and say, look at all the great stuff we're doing. So that's number two. And number three, you've got the company just firing on all cylinders, truly at a transformative moment in human history. We've never seen data the way we're able to see it now. And Palantir is the only company that does what it does and is capable of drawing the lines between those data points. Again, that conventional computing and analysis can't see. So you add all that stuff up, that makes it must have, that makes the CEO visionary, and finally that gives the company some gravitas. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And I really like how, you know, a lot of companies are now offering some sort of large language model capability. But as time goes on, that's just going to become a commodity and it's not going to be very flashy anymore. But Palantir differentiate themselves, in my opinion, by having ontologies, by understanding how you stack an ontology on top of artificial intelligence LLMs. And then you allow your customers, whether that's on the commercial side or, you know, the government side, to not only understand their data, but to actually get actionable insights from it that make business and organizational changes. And that's the key right there. Uh -huh. Actionable insights. Yeah. Actionable. It's got to be actionable because there isn't a company in history that gets out there, becomes number one, and then gets to rest. Because competitors are always nipping at your heels. You've got to continue to be moving forward. So if you are providing, and this is what we try to do in our own business, if you are providing actionable information your clients can use and make valuable on their own, that is absolutely a recipe for success. And you've got companies like NVIDIA doing it. You've got companies like Apple doing it. You've got companies like Microsoft doing it. And funny enough, it's actually a very, very short list. But those are all big, mature companies. Palantir is still in its infancy. Yeah. And like you just said as well um, in, in the previous section, they are very diversified in terms of revenue, aren't they? They've got their commercial segment, 
but also their government segment. And I think a lot of people for a very long time worried about them being very, I don't know what the correct word is, maybe a, people say that they're a spy company, they're too secretive, because obviously some of these government contracts, they couldn't share. They couldn't just freely speak about it. But you you were someone, as far as I understand, that was quite early on in Palantir. You know, you you took a position before a lot of people did. So I guess my question next is, what were you noticing about Palantir when you first started following this company, when you first started investing, that maybe most other analysts and other retail investors at that time were just simply not seeing? Like, why, why were you so willing so early on? Well, again, you know, I've been doing this a long time. So when I see a company that's got its act together, number one, I'm going to take a closer look. But number two, mm -hmm. when I start taking a closer look and I see that executive has actually been doing what he's doing for a long period of time, mm -hmm. I see that the company has a history of saying, we're going to do X and then they actually do it. It's not buying it. this mm -hmm. guy's stuff, right? And then on top of that, when, you know, again, I'm a big fan of keeping it stupid simple. So when I started talking to current and former generation intelligence officers, and they said, oh, yeah, we all use Palantir. When I started mm -hmm. talking to computer scientists, they said, oh, yeah, we like Palantir because they're innovative. When I start talking to competitors whose sales agents actually own Palantir stock and compete against it, and they say they're the ones to deal with, right. <laughs> everything started to come into, you know, the, the, the world coalesced, if you will. Mm -hmm. So I'm not any smarter than the next person, but you know, the gift that I've been given for whatever reason is the ability to see that big picture when it locks into place. And I was very fortunate to get this one right. I, I could have easily been wrong. Mm -hmm. So what do you think of a, like, so there's still a lot of analysts out there that are very bearish and very skeptical on Palantir. <laughs> what? Well, so why do you think that is? Well, you know, and I chuckle because you know, I run into these folks all the time, right? Yeah. And okay, so number one, I think that history is going to go against them and it's going to go against them rather badly. So number one, you know, we got to get that off the table. But number two, you know, Wall Street has a very interesting problem. And it's one that most investors, particularly newer investors, don't understand. And here's the deal is analysts are not in the business of making you money. Analysts work for typically the sell side, meaning the big firms that are interested in distributing their research because they want to use it as a marketing piece to attract clients, right? right? So they don't have to be profitable. They don't even have to be right. What they have to do is simply portray the information. But the problem with that historically is that analysts are box checkers, right? I mean, there's a lot of good people out there. There's a lot of smart analysts out there, but the ones who really know what they're doing are few and far between. And the problem that the analyst community has, Haley, is that they have to be box checkers. Mm -hmm. Is this a tech company? Does this fit into my diversification strategy? Does it have, you know, such and such a PE? Does it have X, Y, and Z? So, so there's this whole pre-sorted mechanism out there. And when you get a company that doesn't fit that mechanism, they don't know what to do with it, so they pretend it doesn't exist or they poo-hoo it because mm -hmm. somehow they're smarter than everybody else. But the last point I want to make is that many of these analysts, the ones who are supposedly responsible for being brilliant about this particular stock, have never worked in the tech industry, couldn't write a line of code if they had to, don't understand classified environments, have no idea how the military works, don't know how to do targeting, don't know how to do oncology, don't know how to do all these other things. So why on earth, if you're an independent investor thinking for yourself, mm -hmm. are you going to listen to them? It's like designing yeah. a camel by committee. It ain't going to work. Yeah, I quite often like, and obviously I'm I'm not a Wall Street analyst. I don't I don't know the game very much. But from you, you, I I would push back on that respectfully. You absolutely are an analyst, and you do know the game because you are thinking independently. <laughs> that is exactly why investors are successful. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate that. But what I was going to go on to say there was, I quite often say that when it comes to Tesla and Palantir in particular, two very volatile companies, two companies that people seem to, you know, very much be for or against, there's not really yep. much of a gray area, it seems with those two companies. I tend to see that a lot of analysts maybe don't particularly like these companies, because they're looking at the and correct me if I'm wrong, Keith, here, that they seem to be looking at the figures that they see here and now in front of them. They don't look too far in the future. They don't really, and it's fair enough, that's kind of the way they've got to do it. They've, they've got to plug the numbers in and do what they need to do. But they're not really thinking about, okay, well, this could end up like this. You know, thinking about RoboTaxi, thinking about Optimus. These things aren't always within their models, it doesn't seem. Would that be a correct assumption? 
Oh, I think that's a very correct assumption. It's mm -hmm. a sharp observation. And, and I was just talking about that on, on one of the networks yesterday. You know, right. the problem is that the news cycle has become very short term. It's become instantaneous. For example, let me put this really in context. In the 1800s, 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, as late as the early 1900s, when you had a global event, it would take two to three weeks, maybe even a month or more, for news to get around the world. Mm -hmm. So people would read their papers, they'd hear, they they get the telegraph, whatever. Well, now when something happens, you're talking about instantaneous data transmission. So the perception in the public eye is that you've got to constantly get more and more myopic in terms of the information. But the reality of the situation is that when you're investing digitally, particularly with digital investments, is you're dealing with 60, 90, 122, 3, 4, 5 years, you're, particularly with a company like Tesla, for example, where you know building a car isn't just something you do next week for the heck of it. It's something that's going to take years of planning and execution to get there. So the earnings cycle that everybody gets so hyperactive about, and today's a great example with the market yeah. getting carried out feet first. I mean, people like headlines, ah! But Wait. when in doubt, you zoom out because, uh -huh. because if you think about it, right, I mean, uh, headlines and, and earnings seasons don't match because mm -hmm. what they're doing is they're saying, oh, what's happening every 90 days? A company like Palantir or Tesla or NVIDIA is looking out nine, 10 months, nine or 10 years. And they're saying, where we got to go? What investments do we have to make? So, you know, to me, one of our favorite sayings with our clients is when in doubt, zoom out. And it's very, very true. Yeah. And that's my, my dad recently started his own portfolio. He's never been an investor. He recently started investing. Oh, good and for him. Yeah, it's exciting. It's exciting. We have a lot of conversations at the moment because he'll be checking his portfolio and he'll be saying, oh, but Haley, I, I can't buy any more insert stock. We'll just say, I don't know, Amazon. Can't buy any more Amazon right now because look, Haley, it's, it's, it's at a high. I need to wait until it comes back to this point. And I just <laughs> try to say, yeah, but if you then, you know, zoom out to the max, literally go on Google, type in Amazon stock, press the max button so you can see the whole chart and then pick any one point and at that time, that would have been the highest. And with that mindset, you would never have gone any higher. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, here's a data point. Here's a data point that catches a lot of people by surprise. Our studies show that since 1927, mm -hmm. the markets have spent 83.75% of the time at or within 10% of all time highs. Okay. So these people who are constantly running around say the sky is falling. Well, the sky never truly falls. The markets are constantly making new highs. Mm -hmm. So to your point, if you're worried about it being high now, imagine how you're going to feel in five years, 10 yeah. years, 20 years. You're going to think, oh, man, that was cheap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, good, it's a good point. It's hard to do. But once I think you get into that mindset, you then are looking more for the opportunities rather than panicking about FOMO in. in. But you, you were mentioning earnings right, right there. And yeah, we've just obviously had the Q2 Tesla earnings. I don't know what the stock is down right now, but last time I checked, it was sitting at around 10% on the day down by. Oh, yeah, it's 10 or 12%, something like yeah, that, but whatever. Like that. <laughs> yeah, whatever, exactly. That's kind of answered the next question, but I'm going to put this to you anyway, because I think you've got a lot of wisdom to share here. And we've got the uh, Palantir earnings coming up soon, I think the 5th of August, if memory serves me right. Um, so I guess the question is, how much attention do you, do you pay and do you think in long-term investors should pay to quarterly earnings. And how much does that feed into the bigger investment thesis for you? Well, that's a very insightful question. Um, there's two answers to it. One, you know, one from in terms of volatility, I pay it almost no attention whatsoever. Okay. What I'm looking for on a quarterly earnings call is does the company continue to execute? Mm -hmm. Are there any red flags that suggest it's going off task? So for okay. example, if if Apple, which is, you know, ecosphere extraordinaire. If Tim Cook suddenly announced that he was ditching everything and making swimming pools, <laughs> I'd be going like a shot, you know, unless they're really smart swimming pools and they link to your iPhone. But, you know, that's a different deal. Uh, but my point is, you know, if you think back, we talk about the criteria for the stocks we addressed a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. If you've got a visionary CEO, a must-have product, and somebody who's executing, what you really want to do in the earnings call is you want to listen for those talking points that suggest they are on the longer-term course, that they are mm -hmm. on the longer-term horizon, that they're still playing that longer-term game. The short-term stuff comes and goes. Mm -hmm. I don't care. doesn't matter. But if I hear somebody go off the rails, 
that's a concern. But beyond that, I'm going to be interested in playing offense. I'm going to be interested in going down that longer term path. So when mm -hmm. Carp comes up, when his team comes up, you know, I'm going to be looking to, you know, are our customers still happy? Are they beating down the door to come to us? Are they continuing to move forward? Those are the things that are going to keep me interested in that stock longer term. But if he suddenly shows up and goes, hey, I'm making margarita machines and he's not Elon Musk, that's a problem. And if he's not Elon Musk, I like that. It's Elon Musk, you know, flamethrowers, surfboards, <laughs> he does I mean, whatever. whatever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but, 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 you know, again, that's, that's why visionary leaders are so important, Haley, is because, you know, if, if, if I had a dollar for everybody who told me Elon Musk would be a failure and he'd blow up the world, then you know what? I'd be parking my yacht next to Jeff Bezos's yacht. You know, the, yeah. the point is the only thing that the naysayers that get right is they've consistently been wrong for as long as he's been a publicly traded company. And so betting against somebody like Steve Jobs or Alex Karp is like mm -hmm. betting against, or betting against Elon Musk is like betting against Steve Jobs back in the day. Yeah, I honestly think Elon Musk, like Tesla aside is is doing some wonderful work and he's, he's oh, yeah. one of the most important, you know, free speech, everything like that tying in, one of the most important people that we have. And I think there's a lot of similarities actually between Elon and Karp, Musk and Karp. Oh yeah, Musk, Carp, Jobs, Cook, uh, yeah. Nadella of Microsoft, uh, Sir Richard Branson. Mm -hmm. You know the the visionary leaders, regardless of industry, tend to have several common personality traits. And you know, being on the edge of what others perceive as lunacy is one. That's crazy. Yeah. 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 Are there any challenges that you do see for Tesla and Palantir that could actually maybe change things for you? Well, sure. I mean, you know, that's a question I ask myself every day, you know, because mm -hmm. the the one thing, again, that is going to cause me to go off task or get away from a stock is if I see them going away from the reasons why I bought it. Mm -hmm. So the ultimate test for me, like it is for Warren Buffett or Ron Barron or, or the late Sir John Templeton is, you know, is the company continue to execute? Does do the reasons that I bought it still exist? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, yeah, if I saw Elon Musk suddenly making bad judgment calls when I felt he didn't have, you know, the longer term framework in mind, I'd be gone like a shot. If I saw Alex Karp doing the same thing, I'd be I'd be out of there in a you know in a New York minute. But that isn't happening. Those those individuals continue to execute. They continue to do well. And and as long as that comes, I'm willing to you know, get driven a little crazy because I know what they're likely to do with the stock. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very much assuming in terms of Tesla, you're thinking, you're thinking about the next five, 10 years. You're not thinking just automotive right now. You're not too worried that, you know, one quarter earnings may oh. show a slight decline of, yeah. Okay. Anybody who's thinking about Tesla in terms of cars terms of car, yeah. <laughs> lost the plot a long time ago. Yeah. I mean, cars are about like this. You're talking about the data packs. You're talking about a global de facto charging standard. You're talking about energy storage. You're talking mm -hmm. about the largest driving database that's ever been assembled in the history of humanity. Anybody in the finance business, the insurance business is going to have to go to it. If you're talking about robotics, people are going to have to deal with the supercomputers. They're, I mean, it's just there's so many different things that he's doing. And what annoys people about Elon Musk, in my humble opinion, mm -hmm. is that he can do whatever he wants. He knows exactly what he's going to go do. And then he does it. And he doesn't play yeah. by the rule book. You know, he plays by his own rule book, which again, yeah. to me, is the hallmark of a great executive. So I'm willing to put up with the differences or the uncertainties or the the court of a public opinion. Yeah. And I think a lot of people say, well, you know, I, I can only view it as a car company because that's where they're getting the revenue from right now. But oh. actually, even mm. even if even if you look at just um the the existing money coming in so you exclude robo taxi you exclude fsd and you exclude optimus and you just look at energy and services those two areas combined energy energy generation and the services and other sections have gone from being i think like 14 percent of the total revenue to now like 22 percent, something like that in, in not very long at all i can't remember the exact figures but the point is even if you exclude those future things it is still very much a shift in business it is still oh, yeah. not relying on one area. But that's but that's the key, right? I mean, the investors today, because they've fallen prey to the analysts and the updates mm -hmm. and the earning seasons, they have the attention span of a mosquito. <laughs> and you can't invest like that. You know, mm -hmm. you, you've got to have a bigger, broader attention span. And to a point we, we talk about constantly with our folks, you know, when in doubt, zoom out. And if you can't do that respectfully, and I, I push back on clients all the time, you have no business 
being an investor. You're a speculator. Get out of the business, go to Las Vegas, go to Monte Carlo, go somewhere else because you're going to have more money and you're going to get free drinks. Yeah, makes sense. What do you say to people that um, that say things like, I'm not buying Palantir right now because it's got a, an unjustified high valuation? The stock's run up too much. Is that the same sort of answer? Like zoom out, think about long term? No, that's actually a highly specific answer. Okay, um, go for it. In, in, in this instance, you know, number one, when somebody tells me that, I tell them, okay, two things. Number one, PE ratios, if you look at your research, mm -hmm. PE ratios have zero impact on future stock prices and earnings, period. Mm -hmm. So this idea that PE ratios are expensive, therefore stock is going to fall or I'm not going to buy it. don't buy, yeah. They don't understand the data and they don't understand their history. That's a very common misperception that is accepted as gospel and taught as dogma. And if you think about this, right? So let's, I mean, let's really cut to the bone on this one. Mm -hmm. If you're believing the high PE argument, if you're believing all of this kind of stuff, then Intel should have outperformed NVIDIA for the last 25 years, mm -hmm. right? Because NVIDIA always had the higher PE, therefore it was the worst buy according to that logic. But yeah. in fact, it's been the other way around. NVIDIA is, is just crushed Intel. And the big companies have gotten bigger, they've gotten stronger, and they've gotten more profitable. So That's number one, argument. yeah, PEs, I mean, no, zero predictive value mm -hmm. whatsoever. That's it. Uh, second thing is, the other thing about this is becoming apparent, I've been a lone voice in the wilderness about this for a long time, <laughs> but people are beginning to understand that Fitzgerald might not be as nuts as everybody says. Uh, accounting regs do not account for digital investments, Haley. Here's mm -hmm. the thing. If Accounting regs, which were largely constructed 100, 125 years ago for manufacturing, farming, inventory, people, and costing, cannot capture digital investment. Mm. Therefore, PE ratios, as companies become more and more digital, PE ratios are going to creep higher. So counterintuitively, when you look at a company like Palantir or NVIDIA or AMD, any of which have got high PE ratios right now, that's a good thing. Because it means that the digital investing has not yet been capitalized and will come onto the balance sheet at some point. Mm, that's really interesting. I've, I've actually never heard that argu argument put forward before. So, well, no, like I said, I'm I'm the lone voice yeah. in the wilderness on this. And when I first raised this on CNBC two years ago or three years ago, whatever it was, people looked at me like I was a stark raving lunatic. <laughs> uh, you know, and it's like, well, okay, fine. I've been there before. I got a thick skin. This is you know, this is the nature yeah. of what I do for a living. Uh, but now I'm beginning to see people saying, well, wait a minute. If the accounting regs aren't right, then that means all the low PE companies everybody thinks are so great are really dog poop and we shouldn't buy them. And in fact, we should be buying the companies with the high PE ratios mm -hmm. because they're the ones with the digital investment. And if you look at the stocks that we encourage our clients to buy and that we talk about in our research, that's exactly what's playing out. Mm hmm. So I've, I've also heard a couple of interviews that you've done where you've mentioned an investing strategy that you personally follow, uh, buy and manage rather than buy and hold. Yes. I want to ask you about this because, and this feeds into another question, which is the whole idea of taking profit, redistributing profit into other positions. It's something that I personally do struggle a little bit with knowing what to do here. And obviously we're not giving financial advice here. We're just having a conversation about our strategies, but Yep. I always struggle with, okay, well, let's just say my Palantir position is doing really, really well. I could take some profit off the table. I then have that in cash in my portfolio. Do I leave it in cash until maybe Palantir or Tesla, the two positions I'm trying to build up, drop and, and put it back in at that point? Who knows when that will happen? Or do I leave it alone? Or do I take it off in cash and use it in my everyday life? Again, I don't need it. That's why it's in the portfolio. I want it to be growing for me. Do you see my dilemma? That's where I struggle. <laughs> what, what do I do when I don't have anywhere else I want it? Well, you know, number one, again, it's a very sharp observation. Most most people never put two and two together. They just think, oh, I'm going to the track. I got a winning horse, whatever. I'm going to see him run. Now, and when I talk about buy and manage, what I'm talking about is constantly, it's like managing an orchard. You know, you plant your trees, you grow them, you weed them, you fertilize them, you get fruit, you pick it, you go back for the next year for the harvest. So buy and hope 
is not an investment strategy. Buy and manage means you buy intelligently, you prune every once in a while. And there are a couple different ways to do that, right? Uh, if you've got a portfolio with very focused goals and you know what those goals are, then you can prune a little bit and redeploy into stocks where you maybe want to own some more shares or maybe you want to put it in cash for a little while. But this idea of trying to guess the markets because they might do this, no. What you want to think about is what are they likely to do? And that's great companies are likely to continue to put up profits. The world is likely to come up tomorrow. The sun is going to come up tomorrow. Those are the kinds of thoughts that help you buy and manage a position because you're always playing offense. The moment you decide to take money out of the market or you do something else, either you've got another need, which is fine, or you've decided to do something foolish, like go buy a washing machine or whatever. I mean, you know, to me, it's, it's you know, people want to be rich. They want to be wealthy. They want to be successful but then they don't orient their lives towards making that happen. So mm -hmm. if you're going to be an investor, the mindset that I encourage when I'm talking about buy and manage is that you are constantly planting those seeds, harvesting that fruit, whether you put it back in the same company when it pulls back a little bit or you put it in different countries, the idea is you're constantly moving forward. Okay, that makes sense. So it's not so much a, a not buy and hold, it's a buy and hope, did I hear you say? Yeah, buy and hope is not an yeah. investment strategy, which is what a lot of people do. I mean, they, they buy right. and hope yeah. that it's going to go up. Okay. Well, that's, you know, okay. that's very closely related to the greater fool theory is in some yeah. greater fool is going to come along and buy it from me later. Uh, you know, that's not the way the world works. And so, again, you know, we talk about keeping it stupid simple. We, we focus mm -hmm. very intently on the world's best companies. We buy the best. We ignore the rest because I don't want the risk that comes with the rest. I want to be very, very focused on where the world is going and pick mm -hmm. the stocks accordingly. It's really interesting you said that because you just said, I don't want to buy the rest because it's risky, right? You, you want to concentrate on the best. Absolutely. So do you think that also ties in to having just a, a, a global, globally diversified ETF? Do you think that could be more risky than single? Oh, yeah. like you do. I do as well, well, but this is a journey that I've been on because originally I started with an S&P 500 ETF like pretty much everyone did. Then I moved into dividends, again, reasons for that. And then I moved out of it. And now I'm very much thinking the rest of my investing journey is going to be focused on probably tech companies, probably growth companies, but even so outside of that, the companies that I find to be the next big thing. Well, again, it depends on what you want to accomplish, right? I mean, yeah. you know, I advocate that you want three things. You want growth, you want income, and you want stability. And, mm -hmm. you know, what blend of stocks you pick uh, depends on where you are on that journey. You know, as you get older, income becomes more important. As you're younger, maybe you can have more growth, whatever. But, you know, my attitude, and again, I, you know, this is financial heresy, but diversification is a myth. Diversification mm -hmm. is one of the greatest lies foisted on the investing public, period, in history. It worked for a long time, but now as computerization has entered the mix, we've got zero DTE, we've got uh, liquidity rising, we've got all kinds of margin, we've got you know big black pools, dark pools, whatever you want to call them. You know these things are, are witches brew, and the way to beat that is to choose tactics that Wall Street A has no interest in fighting, and B has the inability to fight. So if you're disciplined, you're focused on the right companies, you're buying and managing. You take away Wall Street's advantage and you put that back on your side of the court. Yeah, it's good. To, it's good to hear people say that, because I think, like you just pointed out, most of the information out there that is available to the masses is very much you have to diversify. Otherwise, you are gambling, you are losing your money. I don't think that's the case as long as you're willing to do your research. If you're not willing to research, then absolutely you, you are gambling. And like you said, you might as well go somewhere else and just put your money in some slot machines. Well, um, I mean, to paraphrase, you know, Warren Buffett, who said it best, you know, diversification is for people who don't know what they're doing. Yeah. You know, OK, you know, fine. There's nothing wrong with that. If that's what your appetite is and you want mm -hmm. to have, you know, over the last five or 10 years, you want to have 200 percent from the S&P 500. That's fantastic. That's good. Yeah. But good. be prepared to deal with the people who have achieved 2,000% yeah. from NVIDIA. Mm -hmm. Well, we're running up to time. So I just want to use the last couple of minutes to really, a very open question. Is I didn't any, do it. You didn't do it. You <laughs> did. I've got the evidence. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any parting pieces of wisdom that you can give us? Something that maybe you've seen throughout your career that really stands out as maybe something that really successful investors do or something that you just really want to, you know, help other people to, to learn? Is there anything you can think of? I know that's a oh, big absolutely. question. Uh, no, no, actually, it's actually something I, I'm asked regularly, you know, what's the one piece of advice okay. that I give to investors around the world? 
you know, and it's, it's this, it comes down to this and it sounds very simple and it sounds very trite, mm -hmm. but it's very, very true in my own career and in those that we've helped for years and years and years, decades. In fact, the single biggest impediment to the markets and to your success mm -hmm. is the person looking back at you in the mirror in the morning. You get that person under control, everything else falls into place. So is that same mindset? Mindset. About your mindset, your psychology. Keep your emotions out of the equation, stick to what you know, stay focused, stay goal-oriented, replace mm -hmm. the fear with progress and initiative and thinking forward. And you know what I mean by that is, is pessimists very rarely make money. Optimists mm -hmm. almost always make money. But what it comes down to is knowing when to be which, right? And mm -hmm. so investing is about continually playing forward if you're doing the job right. It's not about fear, it's about opportunity. And so as long as you maintain that mindset and you look in the mirror every day and say, what am I going to do today that moves me towards my goals? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you gotta think defensively. Sometimes you gotta think offensively. Sometimes you think about profit. Sometimes you think about risk. But the point is, if you're always positioning that in terms of opportunity, chances are you're gonna do just fine. Mm -hmm. That's very good advice. I uh, It's something that I always constantly try and work on as well. And I think a lot of the audience probably do as well. You know, mindset. Well, I do too. I mean, yeah, I'm different. human. I mean, I've been doing this 45 years. And and there are days when I look at myself in the mirror and go, okay, Fitzgerald, you know. Ah, Get yourself together. <laughs> push that fear off to the side. You know better. You know the numbers. You know the companies. Mm -hmm. You didn't start taking stupid pills. You know, let's get to work. And as long yeah. as you've got that person in the mirror under control, like I said, everything else falls into place. But you got to be an optimist. You've got to play mm -hmm. forward because if you're cowering in fear, you're going to lose every time. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, yeah, I think we'll leave it there then because I, uh, that's a good place to stop. And I, again, I really appreciate your time. You're clearly very successful, very smart man. And I, again, appreciate you giving me, giving me your time and Hopefully we can speak again in the future because I well, I'd like to I would be honored. I, I really would. Thank you to everybody watching. Thank you to you, Haley, for having me. And uh yeah, I guess investing is a remarkable journey. I'm thrilled mm -hmm. to have this time with you today. Thank you. I really enjoyed that conversation and I hope you did too. I'm going to leave all of Keith's information where you can find him, all of that good stuff in the description below. And I'll see you in tomorrow's video.